Jack the Ripper is without doubt one of the most famous and elusive serial killers in history. Despite over 100 years of investigation and literally hundreds of suspects and theories, nobody is really sure who Jack the Ripper was or why he committed the horrific acts of violence that he committed. The most well-known suspects include Prince Albert Victor, also known as Prince Eddie, the artist Walter Sickert, physician to Queen Victoria, Sir William Gore, and even Louis Cavill and Joseph Mavic, also known as the Elephant Man. This video will investigate and attempt to clear up the mystery by looking at the suspects and possible motives as well as looking at the victims. Wikipedia names over 30 suspects for Jack the Ripper but many of these suspects on the list lack a motive or any real evidence against them at all. Some were investigated at the time and released due to a lack of evidence and other theories are considered unrealistic such as Lewis Cavill Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, or more commonly known as H.H. Holmes, and Joseph Merrick, who was clearly being cruelly victimised due to his appearance. The story of Jack the Ripper begins in poverty-stricken Whitechapel, London, England, in the year 1888. At a time of high poverty, public unrest, anti royalism and irracial tensions accelerated by an influx of Jews and Irish refugees. People lived in crowded dirty conditions, rats were said to roam the streets and many people were forced to sleep standing up in crowded houses that become known as DOS houses. The Jack the Ripper case highlighted the extreme poverty and terrible living conditions in the East End at the time. This poverty came at a time that the British Empire was approaching its peak and the aristocracy lived in ridiculous wealth, luxury and with huge power and influence. At about 11pm on the 30th of August 1888, a prostitute by the name of Mary Ann Nichols was seen walking the Whitechapel Road. At half past midnight on the 31st of August, she was seen leave a pub in Brick Lane. An hour later she turned out at 18 Fall Street, as she was lacking the four pence required for a bed. She was last seen alive standing at the corner of Osborne Street and Whitechapel Road at approximately 2.30am by her roommate Emily Holland. This was about one hour before her death. Nichols told Holland that she had earned enough money to pay for her bed three times that evening but had repeatedly spent the money on alcohol. At 3.40am, about 150 yards from the London Hospital and 100 yards from Blackwall Buildings, a meat cart driver named Charles Allen Leachmore, who used the name Charles Cross, claimed to have discovered Mary Ann Nichols lying on the ground in front of a gated stable entrance in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. At the time, Another passing cart driver on his way to work, Robert Paul, approached and saw Charles Cross kneeling over the body. Charles Cross called him over. He believed her to be dead, but Paul was uncertain and thought she might simply be unconscious. They pulled down her skirt to cover her lower body as it was raised and they went in search of a policeman. Upon finding one, Cross told PC Jonas Mizen she looks to me as if she's either dead or drunk, but for my part, I believe she's dead. The two men then continued on their way to work, leaving Mizen to inspect Nicole's body. Meanwhile, PC John Neal was on his beat and came from the opposite direction, and by flashing his lantern, called a third policeman to the scene, PC John Fane. 
as the news of the murder spread, three horse slaughterers from a neighbourhood knacker's yard in Whipthorpe Street, who had been working overnight, came to look at the body. None of the slaughterers, the police officers patrolling the nearby street, or the residents of the houses along side Brooks Road reported hearing or seeing anything suspicious before the discovery of the body. Her throat had been severed by two cuts and the lower part of her abdomen was partly ripped open by a deep jagged wound. Several other incisions on the abdomen were believed to be caused by the same knife. Dr. Enwick Llewellyn arrived at 4 a.m. and believed she had been dead for about 30 minutes at the time. He stated that he was surprised by the lack of blood at the crime scene, about enough to fill two large glasses or half a pint at the most. This led police to believe she was not killed where her body was found but put there after the murder. Following the murder of Mary Ann Nichols, Frederick Abilene was brought back to Whitechapel due to his extensive experience in the area. He was placed in charge of the various detectives investigating the Ripper murders. According to the lodging house deputy Tim Donovan and the watchman John Evans, at about quarter to two a.m. on the morning of her death, Anne Chapman found herself without money for her lodging and went out to earn some on the street. At the inquest, one of the witnesses, Mrs Elizabeth Long, testified that she had seen Chapman talking to a man at about 5.30am just beyond the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields. Mrs Long described him as over 40, a little taller than Chapman with dark hair and a foreign, shabby, gentle appearance. He was wearing a deerstalker hat and a dark overcoat. It is believed that Elizabeth Long was the last person to see Chapman alive besides her murderer. Anne Chapman's body was discovered on the morning of the 8th of September 1888 at just before 6am by a market porter and resident of number 29, John Davis. She was lying on the ground near a doorway in the backyard. John Richardson, the son of a resident of the house, had been in the backyard shortly before 5am to trim a loose piece of leather from his boot and carpenter Albert Kadosh had entered the neighbouring yard at 27 Amvi Street at about 5.30 am. They claimed to have heard voices in the yard followed by the sound of something falling against a fence. Her throat was cut from left to right. She had been disemboweled with her intestines thrown out of her abdomen over her shoulders. The morgue examination revealed that part of her uterus was missing. Her protruding tongue and swollen face led Dr. Phillips to think that she may have been exfiliated with an handkerchief around her neck before her throat was cut. There was no blood trail leading to the yard. He was certain that she was killed where she was found. He concluded that she had suffered from a long-standing lung disease and that the victim was sober at the time of her death and she had not consumed alcoholic beverages for at least two hours before it. Phillips was of the opinion that the murderer must have possessed anatomical knowledge. Due to the fact he sliced out the reproductive organs in a single movement with a blade that was about six to eight inches long in the dark. 
Other experts argue that a butcher could have easily have done the same thing. A leather apron belonging to John Richardson lay under a tap in the yard placed there by his mother who had washed it. Richardson was investigated by the police but was eliminated from the inquiry. Rumours and paranoid reports of the apron fed rumours that a local Jew called Leather Apron was responsible for the murders. Leather Apron was a man named John Pizer, a Polish Jew who made footwear from leather. He was arrested even though the investigating inspector reported that at present there is no evidence whatsoever against him. He was soon released after a confirmation of his alibis. John Pizer went on to successfully obtain monetary compensation from at least one newspaper that had named him as the killer. The description given by Elizabeth Long as a shabby gentle appearance wearing a deerstalker hat and a dark overcoat began to lead to suspicions that the killer may not have been from poverty stricken Whitechapel and may have been rich, famous or even part of the aristocracy. Whitechapel was poverty stricken but the brothels used to attract the upper classes. Elizabeth Stride was born in Gothenburg, Sweden on the 27th of November 1843. By March 1865 she was registered by the Gothenburg police as a prostitute and was treated twice for sexually transmitted diseases. She gave birth to a stillborn girl on the 21st of April 1865. Stride's body was discovered close to 1am on Sunday the 30th of September 1888 by Louis Daimschmutz. His horse reacted with panic to something but Louis Daimschutz could not see anything wrong. The yard was dark so he lit a match only to reveal blood still flowing from Elizabeth Stride's neck. It appeared that she had been killed just seconds before he arrived. The police began a mass search of the area but frustratingly they found very little in the way of evidence. The police at the time were not able to use even basic methods like fingerprints because they did not possess the knowledge. They were dependent on eyewitness accounts and evidence left at the scene. Dr George Baxter Phillips thought that Stride might have been pulled backwards on the ground by her neckerchief before her throat was cut. Catherine Eddowes was born in Wolverhampton. At 8.30pm on Saturday the 29th of September, Catherine Eddowes was found lying drunk in the road on Oldgate High Street by PC Lewis Robinson. She was taken into custody and then to Bishopsgate Police Station, where she was detained, giving the name nothing until she was sober enough to leave at 1am in the morning on the 30th of September. On her release, she gave her name as Mary Ann Kelly of 6 Fashion Street. Catherine Eddowes was last seen live at 1.35am by three witnesses that had just left a club on Duke Street. She was standing talking with a man at the entrance to Church Passage, which led southwest from Duke Street to Mitre Square along the south wall of the Great Synagogue of London. At quarter to 2 a.m., Catherine Eddowes' body was found in the southwest corner of Mitre Street by the square's beat policeman, P.C. Edward Watkins. Watkins said that he had entered the square at 1.44am after having previously been there at 1.30am. He called for assistance at a tea warehouse in the square where a night watchman named George James Morris, who was an ex-policeman, had noticed nothing unusual. Neither had another watchman, George Clapp, at 5 metres square, 
or an off-duty policeman, Richard Purse, at three metres square. Did the fact that Catherine Eddowes give a false name at the police station lead to misidentification by the killer? After all, the next victim was named Mary Ann Kelly. Catherine Eddowes' body was found just one hour after Elizabeth Stride's body was found. It is commonly believed that the killer would have either walked or run to the following destination, which was just a few streets away. Some researchers, however, believe this night proves that Jack the Ripper had access to a couch due to the distance of the two murders, combined with how close it appeared to be getting caught with the first murder of the night, and the fact that despite finding the body of Catherine Eddowes just 45 minutes after they had found the body of Elizabeth Stroyd, the police were not sure how long she had been left there. The fact that the killer found time to perform the mutations after killing Catherine Eddowes suggests that he was in no rush to leave the scene, unlike Elizabeth Stroyd, who had no mutilations performed on her. Police Sergeant Dr. Frederick Gordon Brown, who arrived at 2am, said of the scene, The body was on its back, the head turned to the left shoulder. The arms were by the side of the body, as if they had fallen there, both palms upwards, the fingers slightly bent. A thimble was lying off, the finger on the right side. The clothes were drawn above the abdomen. The thighs were naked, a left leg extended in a line with the body. The abdomen was exposed, the right leg was bent at the thigh and knee. The bonnet was at the back of the head, great disfigurement of the face. The throat cut across below the throat was a neckerchief. The intestines were drawn out to a large extent and placed over the right shoulder. They were smeared over some feculent matter. A piece of about two feet was quite detached from the body and placed between the body and the left arm, apparently by design. The lobe and auricle of the right ear were cut obliquely through. There was a quantity of clotted blood on the pavement on the left side of the neck, around the shoulder and upper part of the arm. The fluid blood-coloured serum, which had flowed under the neck to the right shoulder, the pavement sloping in that direction. The body was quite warm, no death stiffening had taken place. She must have been dead most likely within the half an hour. We looked for superficial bruises and saw none, no blood on the skin of the abdomen or secretion of any kind on the face. Now spurting of blood on the bricks or pavement around. Now marks of blood below the middle of the body. Several buttons were found in the clotted blood after the body was removed. There was no blood on the front of the clothes. At about 3am on the same day Catherine Eddowes was murdered, a bloodstained fragment of her apron contaminated with faecal matter was found lying in a passage of a doorway leading to flats 108 and 119 model dwellings Galston Street Whitechapel above it on the wall was graffiti in chalk that read the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing it is not known if it was definitely written by the killer, but Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Charles Warren ordered it to be washed away before dawn and before it could be photographed. He feared the writing may spark anti-Jewish riots. Some researchers claim that this graffiti was connected to the Jack the Ripper case and that its meaning can be connected to Freemasonry.
Ibn Abif, a widow's son from Tyre, skillful in working of all kinds of metal, was employed to help build King Solomon's temple. The legend tells us that one day whilst worshipping the grand architect of the universe within the Holy of Holies, Hiram was attacked by three ruffians called Jubela, Jubelo and Jubilum and collectively known as the Jews who demanded the master's word that is the secret name of God. The first ruffian named Jubela struck Hiram across the throat with a 24 inch gauge. The second ruffian named Jubelo struck Hiram's breast over the heart with a square and the third ruffian named Jubelum struck Hiram upon the forehead with a gavel. Upon the third strike Hiram felt dead, his blood therefore was shed within the temple. Ibram, having been killed, was carried out to the east gate of the temple and buried outside Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Early the following morning, King Solomon visited the temple and found the workmen in confusion because no plans had been made for the day's work. Fearing evil had befallen Hiram, King Solomon sent out twelve fellow craft masons to look for him. King Solomon himself accompanied the three who journeyed towards the east. Having finally located the grave of Hiram, Solomon and his fellow masons exhumed the body. A search was made for the master's word, the name of God, but all that was found was the letter G. Finding the word lost, a lament went up. O oh Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? They first took hold of Hiram's body with the bow's grip of the first degree. This failed to achieve its purpose. They then repositioned their hold on Hiram's body using the Jishan grip of the second degree. This also failed to accomplish its purpose. Solomon finally raised Hiram from the dead by using the third degree grip of the Master Mason, the Five Points Fellowship, and uttering in Ibram's ear the phrase Maha Baon. The first three degrees of Freemasonry are based upon this legend. The Scottish and York Rites base themselves largely upon the Hiramic legend that follows after Hiram Abif's resurrection. Ibram Abif was raised from the dead, however, he soon leaves the legend for he is being ushered into a more glorious existence. Solomon is left to continue building the temple. Many decisions have to be made. Solomon first selects seven expert masons to guard the temple before holding a requiem for the departed Hiram Abif. Solomon then appoints seven judges to hand out justice to the workmen building the temple. Five superintendents are installed to oversee the continuing building of the temple. Solomon then focuses upon apprehending the assassins of Hiram Abif. He appoints nine masters who begin the search for their assassins. The first assassin is discovered asleep. He is stabbed in the heart and the head and then decapitated. Solomon hears a report that the two other assassins have fled to Garth, the birthplace of Goliath. Solomon selects 15 masons, including the original nine, who apprehend them. They are placed in prison and then executed. Solomon rewards 12 of the masons by making them governors over the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Solomon finally appoints a builder by the name of Adonavim as the sole successor to Hivim Abif. Adonavim becomes chief architect of the temple which is finally completed. The Masonic legend continues when Solomon begins to build a temple of justice upon the site of a temple built by Enoch who placed within the temple a stone bearing the name of God. Adonavim, the chief architect and two other workmen begin building the temple of justice only to discover Enoch's stone, Solomon and Hivim of Tyre, the Grand Masters of Freemasonry have little choice but to initiate the three workmen into the secrets of the craft. All three are taught the correct pronunciation of the name of God. The Temple of Solomon was destroyed around 586 BC. The name of God was once again lost. Jerusalem was taken captive and the Babylonian captivity began. The captives lived in Babylon for 70 years until King Cyrus of Persia, who was a master of Freemasonry, had a dream. He dreamt that a lion appeared to him saying liberty to the captives. Under the lion's direction, Cyrus proclaimed the release of the Jews. He ordered them to construct a second temple under his guidance. Many of the Jews, especially Nimi, Mia and Ezra, were the initiates of the Masonic Mysteries. They directed all Masons within the mist of the Jews to make the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem with their swords by their sides and trolls in their hands. Despite great sorrow and travail, the temple was completed in the vein of Darius, successor to Cyrus. Darius chose Zerubbabel as Grandmaster in charge of construction of the second temple. Having passed the difficult rites of initiation, Zerubbabel was given the title Sovereign Prince of Jerusalem and was entrusted with the sacred vessels Nabuchadnezzar had taken from Solomon's temple. Zerubbabel, together with King Darius, then funded a new order of temple builders known as the Knights of the East. These knights were among the Masonic workmen who took part in the construction of the Second Temple. This new order of knights became a warrior fraternity. The Hiram legend ends with the House of Kadosh. Upon entering the 30th degree, the Freemason enters the Holy House of the Great Architect of the Universe and rests from his labour. He can sing with truth the song. There's no occasion for level or plumb line, for troll or gavel, for compass or square. Our works are completed, the ark is safely seated, and we shall be greeted as workmen most rare. The gates of the new Jerusalem have opened to him, for he is now said to be perfect. He has become the eternal temple in which the great architect of the universe abides. As described in Freemasonry, the death of a family by Yvonne Kitchen.
On the 2nd of October 1888, two private detectives found a grave stalk in the drain of Dutfield Yard. Matthew Packer kept a shop in Burner Street that had grapes in the window. They subsequently took Packer to Golden Lane Mortuary to view the body of Catherine Eddowes without telling him that she was the Mitre Square victim. Packer did not recognise the woman. The media by now were getting very critical of the police and the fact that two private investigators employed by the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee found the grab stalk led the Evening Standard to attack the police again on the 4th of October. The Whitechapel Vigilance Committee was a group of volunteers who patrolled the streets of London's Whitechapel district during the period of the Whitechapel murders. The volunteers patrolled mainly at night in search of the murderer. The committee was set up by local businessmen who were concerned that the killings were affecting commerce in the area. It was led by George Lusk, a local builder who was elected chairman during the committee's first meeting on the 10th of September 1888. On the 4th of October 1888, White was instructed to make further inquiries and called once again to 44 Burner Street, where Rose Packer told him that the two private detectives had called and that Matthew had gone with them to the mortuary to view Elizabeth Stride's body. On his way there, White met Packer, who was in the company of the two detectives. Packer had seen the deceased at the mortuary and recognised her as the woman that had bought grapes from him at 11pm on the 29th of September. On 11pm on the same day, the two private detectives, Grand and Bachelor, returned to Burner Street, stating that they were to take Packer in a cab to Scotland Yard to see Sir Charles Warren. A written report by Senior Assistant Commissioner Alexander Carmichael Bruce revealed what Packer had to say. On Saturday night, about 11pm, a young man from 25 to 30 who stood about 5 foot 7 with a long black coat buttoned up, soft felt hat, a kind of Yankee hat, rather broad shoulders, rather quick in speaking, rather quick in speaking, rough voice. I sold him half a pound of grapes. A woman came up with him from back church end, the lower end of the street. She was dressed in a black frock and jacket, fur round bottom of the jacket, with a black crepe bonnet. She was playing with a flower like a geranium white outside and red inside. I identified the woman at St George's Mortuary as the one I saw that night. They passed by as if they were going to go up Com Road, but instead of going up they crossed to the other side of the road to the board school and were there for about half an hour until, I should say, half past eleven, talking to one another. I then shut my shutters. Before they passed over opposite to my shop, they waited near the club for a few minutes, apparently listening to music. I saw no more of them after I shut up my shutters. I put the man down as a young clerk. He had a frock coat on, no gloves. Grabs were very expensive at the time and this again indicated that if Elizabeth Stride was with her killer at the time of purchasing the grapes. The killer must have been wealthy compared to the majority of people in Whitechapel at the time. The description of the man purchasing the grapes however did not match previous descriptions. To some this might have indicated that the killer was not working alone or maybe the men described by the eyewitnesses to have been the last to have been seen with Elizabeth Stride and or with 
and Chapman were not their killers. Packer returned to the news again on the 27th of October. He claimed to have seen the man who bought the grapes on the night of Stride's murder again. The report read, Matthew Packer, who keeps a food shop near the gateway where the Burner Street murder was committed, stated on Wednesday that he felt just then greatly alarmed owing to his having seen a man exactly like the man that bought the grapes from him for the murdered woman, Elizabeth Stride, a short time before the murder was committed. He alleges that he had often seen the man before the murder as well as the woman, but he has not seen anyone resembling the man since the murder. Saturday night, he was then standing with his food store in Commercial Road when he observed the man staring him full in the face. After passing and repassing him several times, the man got into the roadway and looked at him in a menacing manner. Packer was so terrified that he left his store and asked a shoe black who was near to keep his eye on the man. His fear was that the fellow was going to stab him. No sooner however had he caught the shoe black's attention to the man then the latter ran away and jumped onto a passing tram car. Another incident involving Packer occurred at the time of the discovery of the Pitchin Street murder in 1889. He claimed to have been attacked on his doorstep by somebody that mentioned the Ripper. Spending three weeks at London Hospital as a result of the attack. Due to drastic changes in his statement, Packer was seen as unreliable and was not called to the inquest despite the possible importance of his testimony. On the 16th of October 1888, George Lusk, the leader of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, received a letter that was addressed to Mr. Lusk from Hell. The letter read, Mr. Lusk, so I sent you half a kidney. I took from one woman, preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate it. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that I took it out with if you wait a while longer. Signed, catch me if you can, Mr. Lusk. The police received hundreds of hoax letters at the time. In fact, the name Jack the Ripper was used on one of those letters, which is how the killer became known as Jack the Ripper. But this letter came with half a kidney and that kidney was later determined to be a human kidney. Dr. Thomas Alpenshaw believed that the kidney was from the left side of a human body, but some researchers doubt it was even a human kidney and even if it was a human kidney thousands of people that worked in the medical field as well as funeral parlours and so on potentially had access to human organs. It was also noted that the grammar of the letter was weak and the writing looked rushed. That 
if the letter was genuine, this could have been to misdirect or an attempt to disguise the handwriting. Due to a lack of evidence, however, most researchers consider the letter to be either a hoax or irrelevant. On the morning of the 9th of November 1888, the day of the annual Lord Myers Day celebrations, Kelly's landlord John McCartney sent his assistant, ex-soldier Thomas Boyer, to collect the rent. Kelly was six weeks behind on her payments, owing 29 shillings. Shortly after quarter to 11am, Boyer knocked on her door, but received no response. He reached through the crack of her window and pushed aside a coat being used as a curtain and peered inside and discovered Kelly's horribly mutilated corpse laying on the bed. The Manchester Guardian on the 10th of November 1888 reported Sergeant Edward Badham accompanied Inspector Walter Beck to the site of 13 Miller's Court after they were notified of Kelly's murder by a frantic boyer. The wife of a local lodging house deputy, Caroline Maxwell, claimed to have seen Kelly alive at 8.30 on the morning of the murder, though she admitted only meeting her once or twice before. Moreover, her description did not match those of those who knew Kelly more closely. Maurice Lewis, a tailor, reported seeing Kelly at 10am that same morning in a pub. Both statements were dismissed by police since they did not fit the accepted time of death. Moreover, they could not find nobody else to confirm the reports. The mutilated corpse of Mary Kelly was by far the most extensive of any of the Whitechapel murders. It was believed this was because the murderer had more time to commit his atrocities in a private room rather than in the street. Dr Thomas Bond and George Baxter Phillips examined the body. Phillips and Bond timed her death at about 12 hours before the examination or sometime between 2am and 8am. The notes of Thomas Bond read The body was lying naked in the middle of the bed, the shoulders flat but the axis of the body inclined to the left of the bed. The head was turned on the left cheek, the left arm was close to the body with the forearm flexed at a right angle and lying across the abdomen. The right arm was slightly abducted from the body and rested on the mattress. The elbow was bent, the forearm supine with the fingers clenched. The legs were wide apart, the left thigh at right angles to the trunk and the right forming on an obtuse angle with the pubis. The whole of the surface of the abdomen and thighs was removed and the abdominal cavity emptied of its viscera. The breasts were cut off, the arms mutilated by several jagged wounds and the face hacked beyond recognition of its features. The tissues of the neck were severed all round down to the bone. The viscera were found in certain parts with the uterus and kidneys with one breast under the head and the other breast by the right foot. The liver between the head and the intestines by the right side of the spleen by the left side of the body. The flaps were moved from the abdomen and the thighs were on a table. The bed clothing at the right corner was saturated with blood and on the floor beneath was a pool of blood covering about two square feet. The wall by the right side of the bed and in line with the neck was marked by blood which had struck it in several places. The face was gashed in all directions 
the nose, cheeks, eyebrows and eyes being partly removed. The lips were blanched and cut by several incisions running obliquely down to the chin. There was also numerous cuts extending irregularly across all the features. The neck was cut through the skin and other tissues right down to the vertebrae, the fifth and sixth being deeply notched. The skin cuts in the front of the neck showed distinct echomosis. The air passage was cut at the lower part of the levix through the crinkoid cartilage. Both breasts were more or less removed by circular incisions, the muscle down to the ribs being attached to the breasts. The intercostals between the fourth, fifth and sixth ribs were cut through and the contents of the thorax visible through the openings. The skin and tissues of the abdomen from the costal arch to the pubes were removed in three large flaps. The right thigh was denuded in front to the bone. The flap of skin included the external organs of generation and part of the right buttock. The left thigh was stripped of skin fascia and the muscles as far as the knee. The left calf showed a long gash through skin tissues and the deep muscles and reaching from the knee to five inches above the ankle, both arms and forearms had extensive jagged wounds. The left calf showed a long gash through the skin and tissues to the deep muscles and reaching from the knee to five inches above the ankle, both forearms had extensive jagged wounds. The right thumb showed a small superficial incision about one inch long with excavation of blood in the skin and there were several abrasions on the back of the hand moreover showing the same condition. On opening the thorax it was found that the right lung was minimally adherent by old firm adhesions. The lower part of the lung was broken and torn away, the left lung was intact, it was adherent at the apex and there were a few adhesions over the side. In the substances of the lung were several nodules of consolidation. The pericardium was open below and the heart absent. In the abdominal cavity there was some partly digestive food of fish and potatoes and similar food was found in the remains of the stomach attached to the intestines. Phillips believed that Kelly was killed by a slash to the throat and the mutilations performed afterwards. Bond stated in a report that the knife used was about one inch wide and at least six inches long, but unlike some of the previous victims, he did not believe the murderer showed any medical training or knowledge whatsoever. He wrote, in each case the mutilations was afflicted by a person who had no scientific nor anatomical knowledge. In my opinion he does not even possess the technical knowledge of a butcher or horse slaughterer or a person accustomed to cutting up dead animals. George Hutchinson written this statement. At about 2am on the 9th, 
I was coming by Full Street, Commercial Street, and just before I got to Flower and Dean Street, I met the murdered woman, Kelly, and she says to me, Butchinson, will you lend me sixpence? I says, I can't. I've spent all my money going down to Romford. She says, good morning. I must go and find some money. She went away toward Fell Street. A man coming in the opposite direction to Kelly tapped her on the shoulder and said something to her. They both burst out laughing. They heard her say, all right to him. And the man say, you'll be all right for what I have told you. He then placed his right hand around her shoulders. He also had a kind of small parcel in his left hand with a kind of strap around it. I stood against the lamp of the Queen's head and watched him. They both then came past me and the man hung down his head with his hat over his eyes. I stooped down and looked at him in the face. He looked at me stern. They both went into Dorset Street. I followed them. They both stood at the corner of the court for about three minutes. He said something to her. She says, all right, my dear, come along. You will be comfortable. He then placed his arm on her shoulder and gave her a kiss. She said she had lost her handkerchief. He then pulled out his handkerchief, a red one, and gave it to her. They both went up to the court together. I went to the court to see if I could see them, but I could not. I stood there for about three quarters of an hour to see if they came out. They did not, so I went away. George Hutchinson described the potential killer's age at about 34-35 height, five foot six, complexion pale, dark eyes and eyelashes, slight moustache curled up each end and dark hair, a long dark coat, collar and cuffs trimmed, astrakhan and a dark jacket under a light waistcoat, dark trousers, felt hat turned up in the middle, button boots and gaiters with white buttons. He wore a very thick gold chain, white linen collar, black tie with a horseshoe pin, a respectable appearance, walked very sharp, Jewish appearance, can be identified. Inspector Aberline subsequently wrote in his report of the 12th of November that George Hutchinson said he had occasionally given Mary Jane Kelly a few shillings throughout the three years that he had known her and that he had been surprised to see a man so well dressed in her company which had caused him to watch them. Inspector Aberloin added that he had interrogated Mr Hutchinson and was of the opinion that his statement was true. He circulated Hutchinson's description of the man to all police stations. Some people claim that these five victims are the only Jack the Ripper victims. Others claim that Jack the Ripper killed only four and some claim that Jack the Ripper may have killed as many as 15. So who was Jack the Ripper? Suspects include Sir Wen Klawowski, also known as George Chapman, no relation to victim Annie Chapman. He was born in Congress, Poland, but emigrated to the United Kingdom sometime between 1887 and 1888, shortly before the start of the Whitechapel murders. Between 1893 and 1894, he assumed the name Chapman. 
he successfully poisoned three of his wives and became known as a Buvat poisoner. He was hanged for his crimes in 1903. He lived in Whitechapel at the time of the Ripper murders, where he had been working as a barber under the name Ludwig Schlowowski. Though Sowent Klowowski, as he was known at the time, did match eyewitness reports, most dismiss him as a serious suspect due to the fact a foreign accent was not mentioned by any of the eyewitnesses. It is not even known if Sloven Klowenski could speak English and if he could he would have definitely had a strong foreign accent. Walter Richard Sickert appears in many different versions and many different roles of the Ripper murders. Author Jean Alverton Fuller and crime novelist Patricia Cornwall in her book's portrait of a killer name him as the possible killer but most do not take him serious as a suspect due to the fact there is evidence that he may have been in France at the time of at least some of the murderers. What he was doing in France was also connected to the Ripper murders according to some theories. George Hutchinson, the last man other than the killer known to see Mary Kelly alive was also suspected by many researchers. Inspector Abilene, after interviewing Hutchinson, believed Hutchinson's account was truthful. Francis Tumbletti was born in 1833. He was an Irish-born American medical quack who earned a small fortune posing as an Indian herb doctor throughout the United States and Canada. He was an eccentric self-promoter and was often in trouble with the law. Tumblety was mentioned as a ripper suspect by former Detective Chief Inspector John Littlechild of the Metropolitan Police in a letter to journalist and author George R. Sims dated the 21st of September 1913. Littlechild suspected Tumblety because of his extreme misogyny and his previous criminal record. On the 5th of May 1865, he was arrested in St. Louis and taken to Washington on the orders of the Secretary of War for alleged complicity in the Abraham Lincoln assassination because the police believed that he was an associate of David Herald. Tumbled, he denied any association with Herald and there was nothing to tie him to the plot so he was released without charge on the 30th of May. On the 7th of November 1888, the Metropolitan Police arrested Tumbleti on unrelated charges of gross indecency, apparently for having been caught engaging in a homosexual encounter, which was illegal at the time. Whilst awaiting trial on this charge on bail of £300, the equivalent of £31,000 today, and knowing that Scotland Yard was increasingly interested in him, with regard to the recent murder spree in Whitechapel, he fled England to France on the 20th of November under the false name of Frank Townsend. And on the 24th of November 1888, he returned to the United States. Already notorious in the United States for his self promotion and previous brushes with the law, Tumbleti's arrest in London was reported in the New York Times as being connected to the Ripper murders. American newspaper reports that Scotland Yard tried to extradite him have not been confirmed by research in the contemporary British press or the London police files. 
in their book Jack the Ripper, the first American serial killer, Stuart P. Evans and Paul Gainley outline 15 reasons why they believe Tumblety could be considered a top suspect in the Whitechapel murders. Tumblety fits many requirements of what we now know as a serial killer profile. He had a supposed hatred for women and prostitutes. Tumblety was in London at the time of the murders and according to Evans and Gainley, he may indeed have been the infamous Batty Street lodger and therefore may have had fair knowledge of the East End environs. He may have had some anatomical knowledge as referred to by his collection of wombs. His medical practice and his short term work with Dr. Liz Pernod of in Rochester. He was arrested in the midst of the autumn of terror on suspicion of having committed the murders. There were normal murders after he fled England on the 24th of November if one only counts a canonical five. Chief Inspector Littlechild, a top name in Scotland Yard, believed him a very likely suspect and was not alone in his convictions. He was fond on using aliases, disappearing without a trace and was subject of police inquiries before his arrest. Scotland Yard and American police had been in touch numerous times concerning Tumblety. One of the three detective inspectors assigned to the case was sent to New York at the time, perhaps to pursue Tumblety. Tumblety evaded capture in New York once again. He had the wealth necessary for frequent travel and could afford to change his clothes frequently if they would become bloodstained, but he was eccentric but shrewd. He had a tendency towards violence at times, and his career may have included other offences both at home and abroad. Several acquaintances of his in America believed it was likely that he was a ripper when they interviewed him in 1888. Other researchers dismiss him as the Ripper due to the fact he did not match descriptions given by eyewitnesses at the time and there is no evidence on him other than the fact he was in England. The secret identity of Jack the Ripper is a 1988 investigation into Jack the Ripper. FBI Special Agent John Douglas, Forensic Pathologist William Eckert, Crime Historian Martin Fido and other experts unanimously come to the conclusion that Jack the Ripper was Avon Kaminsky. Avon Kaminsky was a Polish Jew who emigrated from Russian Poland to England in the 1880s. He worked as an hairdresser in Whitechapel in the East End of London where a series of murders ascribed to the Ripper were committed. He worked as an hairdresser in Whitechapel in the East End of London. From 1891 he was institutionalised in an insane asylum. Police officers from the time of the murders named one of their suspects as Kaminsky, the forename was not given, and described him as a Polish Jew in an insane asylum. Almost a century after the murder, the suspect was identified as Avon Kaminsky, but there was little, if any, evidence to connect Avon Kaminsky with the same who was suspected of the murders and their dates are different. 
possibly Kaminsky was confused with another Polish Jew of the same age named Avon or David Cohen, real name Nathan Kaminsky, who was a violent patient at the time. In September 2014, author Russell Edwards claimed to have proved Kaminsky's guilt using mitochondrial DNA evidence from a shore he believed to have been left at the murder scene. His claim has not been published or verified by any peer review process and his methods and findings have been criticised. Like Klawinski, Alan Kaminsky would have had a foreign accent and would probably not have been as well dressed as George Hutchinson's description. The secret identity of Jack the Ripper in 1988 also gave the audience a chance to vote on who they believed Jack the Ripper was based on the evidence presented to them in the show. 25% voted Sir William Gore as well as 23% that voted Prince Albert Victor also known as Prince Eddie. Avon Kaminsky received 20% of the vote. Prince Albert Victor was the eldest child of King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra and grandson of Queen Victoria. From the time of his birth he was second in line of succession to the British throne but never became king. He died before his father and grandmother the Queen. Prince Albert Victor is regularly brought up as a Jack the Ripper suspect but according to some theories he could have been another victim of the same killer. Prince Albert Victor's intellect, sexuality and mental health have been subject to much speculation. Rumours at the time of the Ripper murders linked him with the Cleveland Street scandal which involved a homosexual and underaged brothel. The rumours were never published in the British media at the time but foreign media did expose Prince Albert Victor as a visitor to the brothel. Other prominent aristocrats were also exposed as regular visitors. Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline was in charge of that case. Lord Henry George Somerset became aware that he was under investigation for his involvement in the scandal. It had been named by several male prostitutes as a customer of their services. He was interviewed by police on the 7th of August 1889. Although the records of his interview has not survived, it resulted in a report being made by the Eternal General Solicitor and Director of Prosecutions urging that proceedings should be taken against him under Section 11 of the Criminal Amendment Act 1885. It is believed that he gave the initials on a piece of paper of a member of the royal family the initials were P.A.V., which stood for Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Clarence and Avondale, his employer and second in line to the throne, who he alleged frequented the brothel for homosexual men. Some claim that Prince Albert Victor, or Prince Eddie as he is often referred to, suffered from syphilis and that the prince went on a revenge killing spree hunting down prostitutes. An examination of court and royal records however revealed that Prince Eddie was not even in London on important murder deaths. On the 29th of August to the 7th of September the Prince was staying with Viscount Down at Danby Lodge, Grousemount, Yorkshire which means he wasn't in London for the Nichols murder on the 31st of August. From the 7th to the 10th of September 1888, the Prince was at the Carvery Barracks in York. Chapman was murdered on the 8th of September. From the 27th of September to the 30th of September, the Prince was in Abergeidy, Scotland, where Queen Victoria recorded her journal that he had lunched with her on the 30th. 
He arrived in London on the 1st of November and was at Sandringham between the 2nd and the 12th of November. So Prince Albert Victor was only in London for one of the four nights that the murders taken place. The next suspect is Ida to disprove. The secret identity of Jack the Ripper's so-called expert panel all come to the conclusion that Aaron Kaminsky was more likely Jack the Ripper other than other suspects including Sir William Gore. Due to Sir William Gore being 72 years old at the time of the murders and having had suffered from strokes and he suffered from a stroke a year before the murders. The panel claimed he would not have had the strength to kill, but they also acknowledged that he would not have been working alone. If William Gore was not working alone, he would not necessarily need to do the killing or any of the hard work. According to this theory, Sir William Gore was being chauffeured by a cab driver called John Netley, along with four other people. This theory has been circulating since at least the 1970s. The story claims that Prince Albert Victor fathered a child by a Catholic girl he married by the name of Anne Crook. The child was called Alice. Upon finding out about Prince Albert Victor's child and marriage, the royal family were furious and worried that at these times of anti-royalism the marriage could lead to a constitutional crisis that could spark the collapse of the British monarchy. In 1973, the BBC launched a television series, Jack the Ripper, which investigated the Whitechapel murders. The series mixed documentary and drama. It featured real evidence, but was hosted by fictional detectives Barlow and Watts, played for by Stratford Johns and Frank Windsor. The series was later made into a book, The Ripper File, by Elwyn Jones and John Lloyd in 1975. The sixth and final programme included a man that called himself Joseph Sickert and claimed to be the illegitimate son of noted painter Walter Sickert. My name is Joseph Sickert. My father was the painter Walter Sickert. When I was a small boy, I can remember my mother telling me over and over again that I had to be very careful not to say anything or do anything which would give the police or the authorities any reasons to question me or any excuse for them to take me away. She said to me that my grandmother had suffered terribly at the hands of the authorities and that a servant girl died in a terrible way and that I had to be very careful. I just thought it was another story that I was told. I sort of uh, thought, if you don't behave, the bogeyman will get you. Then when I was a bit older, in my teens, I asked my father about the story. I kept on nagging him and asking questions about it, and eventually I broke his reserves down. He said, your grandfather was the Duke of Clarence. I laughed, and he said, it's no laughing matter. It's all, uh, it's all a bit of a mess, because you're all bloody Catholics. Then he told me the whole story. When Eddie, the Duke of Clarence, was 20, his mother thought it would be a good idea if he met an artist and writers as well as just usual people who made up court circles at the time. To meet the painter, Walter, uh, she arranged, you know, to, uh, for him to meet the painter, Walter Sicker, whose family had been painters to the own royal court in Denmark. At that time, Walter Sicker lived in Cleveland Street area. When Prince Edward went there during his vacations from Cambridge, he was passed off as Sicker's younger brother known as Mr. S. He also met a close friend of Sickers, a girl called Anne Elizabeth Crook, who worked in the tobacco shop at number 20. 
She actually lived at number six Cleveland Street. She was very beautiful, and in fact, she looked very much like Eddie's mother. Eddie fell in love with her. She became pregnant, and there was also a, sort of a, a wedding ceremony at St. Saviour's private chapel in 1888. The two lovers, Clarence and, Elaz uh, and Elizabeth, were parted after a police raid on a party in Cleveland Street and Anne Elizabeth was in Guy's Hospital for 156 days before she had been put into a small hospital at 367 Fulham Road. She was supposed to be mentally ill. She was kept in the Fulham Road Hospital until the, her death in 1921. The son girl also disappeared at the same time. Her name was Mary Kelly. The little girl, Alice Margaret, was then looked after by Old Water Sicker with the help of various local friends. Now, one day, when she was about seven years old, in 1892, a woman friend was taking her for a walk in Drury Lane. A carriage ran the child down. The driver of the carriage was recognised as John Netley, a man who had been used as an outside coachman by Clarence on his visits to Sickert. A man who knew the story of the lovers and their child, and their Irish servant girl, Mary Kelly. The child, Alice Margaret, was fortunate. After spelling Charing Cross Hospital, she recovered from her injuries. Mary Kelly was not so lucky. She was, of course, a Catholic girl. She was known to the nuns at the, of the convent in nearby Edward Place. She went first of all to their sister convent, which was in the East End. What happened then was that various people high in the government and the royal household became very worried, indeed, about the possibility of the news getting out that the heir presumptive to the throne of England had married and had a child, and that the child had been born of a Catholic mother. You have to remember it was a time when the possibility of revolution was thought to be a very real one, and that the problems and violence surrounding Ireland were at their height. It was decided that Mary Jane Kelly would have to be silenced. The operation was undertaken by the driver, John Netley, and the royal physician, Sir William Gull. To conceal the dangerous motive behind Mary Kelly's death and the inquiries they were making for her, she was killed as the last of the five women in a way that made it look like the random work of a madman. The child, however, survived. She was protected by Walter Sicker and had two sons by him. The first one was Charles, who disappeared at the age of two, and I am the other son. He claims his grandmother had an affair and eventual marriage in a secret ceremony with Sickert and Anne's friend Mary Jane Kelly acting as witnesses. Joseph Sickert alleges that Albert Victor and Annie's daughter Alice Margaret Crook was born on the 18th of April 1885 and that Prince Albert Victor settled Alice and Annie into an apartment in Cleveland Street in April 1888. He also claims that Walter Sickert took the child to France to protect the child from the British establishment. Walter Sickert and Alice would later have a son called Joseph. Joseph Sickert continues, Queen Victoria and the British Prime Minister Lord Salisbury discovered Albert Victor's secret. He accuses Salisbury of ordering a raid on the apartment because he was afraid that public knowledge of the potential Catholic heir to the throne would result in a revolution. Sickert also claims that Albert Victor was placed in the custody of his family while Anne was forcibly taken to Guy's Hospital in London where she stayed for five months and while she was there Sir William Gull, Queen Victoria's personal physician performed a partial frontal lobotomy on her, in effect rendering her docile and compliant. According to John Aymer in his book The Falsification of Our History, A Distorted Reality. Joseph Sickard claimed that John Netley drowned after an attempt to kill baby Alice Crook, having run to Westminster where he jumped off a pier. Sickert was wrong on this as John Netley died in what appeared to be a freak accident in 1903 in which 
he was run over by his own cart and therefore Sickert could not have based the story on contemporary evidence researched himself as was often suggested. A newspaper report was apparently found of a man who gave his name as Nickley being rescued from a river by a pier master and later discharging himself from hospital. It's theorised that Nickley could have been misheard Netley or a quickly assumed name. Stephen Knight, writer of Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, said that the dictionary of British surnames did not list Nickley. Fictional detectives Barlow and Watt acknowledge that the Jack the Ripper case looks and feels like a cover-up. The question is why? Joseph Sicker later retracted his comments in an interview with the Sunday Times on the 18th of June 1978. He is quoted as saying, it was an ox, I made it all up, and it was a whopping fib. However, he could not have possibly have made up the fact proven by Barlow and Watt that Annie Elizabeth Crook was institutionalised, as he had explained, and that Alice Crook was his mother. Barlow and Watt showed his birth certificate. Joseph Sickert would later make the headlines again in 1984 when he claimed that the Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe attempted to kill him by running him over. Walter was 25 years older than Alice. The story is that she bore him two sons, Charles and Joseph. From 1899, she lived with Walter in his ward in Deep in France, leaving him when she was 18 to marry William Gorman, an ex-boxer, and bore him seven children. On page 111 of The Ripper and the Royals by Melvin Fairbrook, he reports that Alice married Gorman on the 14th of July 1918 and Gorman died in 1951. Alice continued to have sexual relations with Walter Sickert as Joseph was born five years after Walter Sickert's second wife died and seven years after Alice had married William Gorman. One reason that Walter encouraged the romance between Alice and Gorman was to ensure that further children Alice might have would be born in wedlock and accepted as Gorman's. Seven months after Alice gave birth to Joseph, Walter married for a third time. Some claim and believe that Jack the Ripper was a maniac working alone committing random acts of violence without any real motive other than a hatred for women and that is how it appears until we begin to look a little bit closer. When interviewed in 1903 by the Pall Mall Gazette, Frederick Abilene put forward the theory that George Chapman was the Ripper. He said, I cannot help feeling that this was the man that we struggled to capture 15 years ago. In another interview the same year, he responded to suggestions that the Ripper was dead by saying it is simple nonsense to talk of police having proof that the Ripper is dead. Dated in several quarters that Jack the Ripper was a man who died in a lunatic asylum a few years ago, but there is nothing of all that of a tangible nature to support such of a theory, and soon after the last murder in Whitechapel the body of a young doctor was found in the Thames. But there is absolutely nothing beyond the fact that he was found dead at a time to incriminate him. The fact that he also said Scotland Yard is really none the wiser on the subject than it was 15 years ago implies that there was no conclusive evidence against anybody that it was merely Abilene's own personal opinion that Chapman was the Ripper. Thank you. 
Some believe, however, that Scotland Yard knew exactly who Jack the Ripper was, and not only did they never expose the Ripper, but they covered it up and helped protect him. Why would Scotland Yard do that? The answer is national security. So shocking would the exposure have been, it could have sparked a revolution against the already very unpopular British monarchy, aristocrats and establishment. Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill was born on the 13th of February 1849 at Blenheim Palace. He was educated at Eton, where he neither excelled in sport nor stood out academically. He was the supposed father of future British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. He married an American, Jenny Germain, daughter of Leonard Germain, in 1874 in what some believe was a shotgun wedding due to the fact that Jenny Germain, Winston Churchill's mother, was carrying the child of the future King of England, Edward VII. That child was Winston Churchill. Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill was elected MP for Woodstock in 1874. He remained MP for Woodstock until 1885, then became MP for South Paddington. He was made Secretary of State for India in 1885 in Salisbury's cabinet, a position he held until the following year when he was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer and Leader of the House of Commons. Apparently when Churchill was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1886, Queen Victoria opposed the appointment and described Churchill as mad and odd. He ended up a disliked politician who made enemies even among his own colleagues. When due to speak in the House of Commons, the cry would go out, brandies up and the chamber would quickly fill. His speeches were described as often controversial and always brilliant. He tendered his resignation as Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1886 without any expectation that it would be accepted by Lord Salisbury. It was, and he spent the last eight years of his life in political wilderness. His short political career was summed up by Lord Salisbury, Salisbury's successor as Prime Minister when he said it consisted of a lot of noise and very little in the way of achievement. Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill is believed to have resembled George Hutchinson's extraordinarily detailed description of a man seen with Mary Kelly shortly before she was murdered. The Pall Mall Gazette in June 28, 1884 described Churchill as of average height with a wide turned up moustache beautifully dressed. His gold chain as a solid appearance of Real 18 carats. James Maybrick was a well-known cotton merchant in Liverpool. He is rated as the number one suspect for being Jack the Ripper by casebook.org. The world's largest repository of Jack the Ripper related information as voted by its visitors. He emerged as a suspect in 1992 
when his apparent diaries and confessions surfaced. The diary author does not mention his name but offers enough hints and references consistent with Maybrick's established life and habits that it is obvious that the readers are expected to believe that it is him. The author of the document details alleged actions and crimes of a period of several months, taking credit for slaying the five women most commonly credited to Jack the Ripper, as well as two other murders which to date have not been historically identified. Most researchers however believe the diary to be a probable fake. In 1889, Maybrick's wife was sentenced to be hanged after she was convicted of his murder. The trial was said to be, by any standard, a horrible travesty of justice. Within two years, the trial's presiding judge died in an insane asylum. Fifteen years later, Florence Elizabeth Maybrick was finally released from prison. Arsenic is an addictive substance, and some researchers claim overwhelming evidence suggests that James Maybrick carried out this habit up until his grave. Michael Barrett confessed to forging the diary. If he did forge the diary, however, he probably done some research before forging it. Scottish lawyer William McDougall alleged in 1891 the existence of a previous spouse to James Maybrick. Although no marriage certificate has ever been found, the 1981 census record released in 1992 after 100 years appeared to confirm this allegation. Sarah Ann Robertson, listed as single and aged 44, was residing in London at the time. Other legal documents, however, lists the same person as Sarah Ann Maybrick. In 1868, her father's will, for example, shows her as Sarah Ann Maybrick, wife of James Maybrick. Upon her death on the 17th of January 1927, she is listed in the records as Mary Ann Maybrick, otherwise Robertson. She lived for a while on Bromley Street near Whitechapel and on Mark Lane across the road from Whitechapel. In all probability, James Maybrick's association led to him being familiarised with the area where the Jack the Ripper murders occurred. James Maybrick's entire case is based around a diary that has not been proven to be fake but has also not been proven to be genuine. Tests on the ink used in the diary have come out inconclusive. If James Maybrick is Jack the Ripper, his motives are unclear. And why would the police perform a cover-up operation to protect a cotton merchant? In an article first published in the Evening News during the 26th, 1976 and later reprinted in the Ripper and the Royals, Nigel Morland recalled visiting Abilene when the inspector was living in retirement in Dorset. Morland claimed that Abilene told him that the case was shut and that I have given my word to keep my mouth permanently closed about it. Abilene went on to say, I know and my superiors know certain facts and that the Ripper wasn't a butcher, yid or a yard skipper. You'd have to look for him, not at the bottom of London society, but at the top, a long way up. The question is, why would Abilene 
have given his word to keep his mouth permanently closed about it. There is really only one answer. Jack the Ripper was powerful and influential. He was protected by police and working for powerful people that had huge influence. It is known that many of the police and suspects that were involved were Freemasons. Joseph Sickert, also known as Joseph Gorman before changing his name by Depot, claims to be the illegitimate son of Walter Sickert and Alex Crook, daughter of Anne Crook, whom he raised after her mother's cruel treatment by Sir William Gorman. He claims Alice Crook married an ex-boxer called William Gorman, who raised the children as his own. Joseph Sickert claims that many of Walter Sickert's works contain clues and messages about Jack the Ripper. Some of his works also depict Anne Crook and Alice. In June 1911, Walter Sickert called this art piece Alice. Stephen Knight, writer of Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, explains that at first he did not believe Joseph Sickert's, also known as Gorman's, sensational story, which seemed a rant if entertaining nonsense. But he was so entranced by it that he had to investigate further. Eventually, as the circumstantial evidence began to build up, Knight becomes convinced that Gorman's story is true. The lack of tangible evidence he claims is due to a government cover-up and deliberate misdirection of the police investigation. To back up the claims of a Masonic conspiracy, he notes supposed similarities between Jack the Ripper and alleged Masonic rituals, and accuses Sir Charles Warren, Commissioner of the Police, of destroying evidence to protect his Freemason cronies. Could the huge scale and full-blown blatant cover-up operation that taken place in the aftermath of the murders and still continues to take place today be the biggest piece of evidence in revealing who Jack the Ripper was. The British government, police force and establishment will not bother protecting a Polish immigrant or a middle-class doctor with one of the biggest cover-ups in British political history. For those that do not believe that Jack the Ripper's identity is known by Scotland Yard, they should consider these facts. Frederick Aberline believed there was a cover-up. Frederick Aberline was promoted to First Class Inspector on the 9th of February 1888 and to Chief Inspector on the 22nd of December 1890 following the murder of Mary Ann Nichols on the 31st of August 1888, Abilene was seconded back to Whitechapel due to his extensive experience in the area. Frederick Abilene probably knew as much about the case as anybody. Surely that makes his opinion important. Sir Charles Warren was not the only Freemason to be brought up when it comes to covering up the Jack the Ripper story. Stephen Knight writes Sir William Gore and Sir James Anderson were Masons and Lord Salisbury's father had been Vice Grand Master of all of England. So advanced he was that in 1873 a new lodge was consecrated in his name. 
Even George Lusk, the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, was a Freemason, having been initiated in Dovick Lodge on the 14th of April 1882, but he was excluded from the, his membership of the lodge in 1889 for non-payment of dues. The claim of Masonic involvement was refuted by John Hamill, the former librarian for the Freemasons United Grand Lodge of England, subsequently the Director of Communications. He writes, The Stephen Knight claims are based upon the claim that the main protagonists, the Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, Sir Charles Warren and Sir James Anderson and Sir William Gore were all high-ranking Freemasons. Knight knew his claim to be false, for in 1973 I received a phone call from him in the library in which he asked for confirmation of their membership. After a lengthy search, I informed him that only Sir Charles Warren had been a Freemason. Regrettably, he chose to ignore this answer as it would have ruined his story. How many Masons were involved as suspects in the investigation as police and other senior officials is always hard to prove due to the secrecy involved in Freemasonry, but it's clear there were quite a few. Unlike many other theories that paint Jack the Ripper as a lone psychopath killing random victims, this theory also offers a motive. After Prince Albert Victor, also known as Prince Eddie, was separated from Anne Crook, as explained earlier, Anne Crook is said to have been made docile by Sir William Gull, and then certified as insane. Some researchers believe Mary Jane Kelly and a group of friends decided to attempt to blackmail the British government using Walter Sickert to pass on their message. Those friends were Mary Ann Nichols, Anne Chapman and Elizabeth Stroyd. Catherine Eddowes was killed in ever after giving her name as Mary Jane Kelly to the police when being released from custody after being arrested for drunkenness. All the victims lived local to each other and some suggest they may have even known each other due to drinking in the same pubs. Could the Catherine Eddowes mistake have been evidence that somebody in the police was aiding Jack the Ripper as described by John Hamer, Stephen Knight and other researchers. Based on the evidence, it is hard to disprove Joseph Sickert's story. There is a fair amount of circumstantial evidence and crazy coincidences, but proving who Jack the Ripper is is still almost an impossible task. I believe that that is due to Jack the Ripper being protected and evidence being intentionally destroyed and covered up. According to John Aimer, the following five people are the Jack the Ripper gang, and though it's hard or maybe impossible to prove who Jack the Ripper was, I believe it seems obvious he had powerful friends and these five people should be investigated. First one being John Nepley, the coachman or carman as he was described at the time. He is said to be the getaway driver. Joseph Sickert believed he attempted to kill baby Alice twice before drowning in the Thames. Records suggest he may have been rescued from the Thames and discharged himself from hospital. According to Walter Sickert, Nepley was broad shouldered, about five foot five, with an insecurity about his height. He was employed as a carman by Messrs. Thompsons, Mackay and Co. and described as a steady worker. He was killed in an accident in 1903 near Clevens Gate of Regent's Park when the wheel of his van clipped a high curb. He was thrown from the vehicle and trampled by his own horses. His head had been crushed by the wheels of his van.
second one being James Kenneth Stephen, an English poet and tutor to Prince Albert Victor. In many versions of the Royal Conspiracy, J.K. Stephen is not mentioned, unlike John Netley, who features in all the versions. In some versions, J.K. Stephen acts as a lookout. Stephen was the second son of Sir James Fitzjames Stephen, barrister at law, and his wife, Mary Richenda Cunningham. J.K. Stephen was known as Jem among his family and close friends, and he was the first cousin of Virginia Woolf. Stephen suffered a serious edge injury in an accident in the winter of 1886 or 1887 which may have accelerated the bipolar disorder in which he already suffered from. His cousin Virginia Woolf suffered from the same disorder throughout her adult life. Stephen was eventually committed to St Andrew's Hospital, a mental asylum in Northampton. In January 1892, the former royal tutor heard that his former pupil, the 28-year-old Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Clarence, a man destined to one day be king, had died of pneumonia at Sandington. On hearing the news, Stephen refused to eat and died 20 days later. Age 32, cause of death according to the death certificate was mania. third person to be investigated should be Sir Charles Warren. Though Sir Charles Warren took no active part in the killing himself, he is believed to have helped facilitate the plot and expedited the cover-up. Many mainstream media outlets deny the plausibility and some outright attack the royal conspiracy or cover-up, but as mentioned earlier, even Inspector Frederick Aberline believed there was a cover-up as he revealed in later life. Sir Charles Warren would have been responsible for much of that cover-up. Sir Charles Warren is also said to have provided information on the girl's whereabouts using his privileged position in the police force. In the case of Catherine Eddowes, he or somebody else in the police force could have unintentionally given the killer false information. Sir Robert Anderson was asked to assist James Monroe, the Assistant Commissioner of Crime at Scotland Yard in operations related to political crime. In 1888, Monroe was promoted to Commissioner and Anderson replaced him as Assistant Commissioner. The Criminal Investigation Department was just then starting the investigation into the Jack the Ripper murders which Sir Robert Anderson thought were being grossly over-sensationalised. Almost immediately after being promoted, Anderson went on an extended holiday in France, leaving others in charge. He was called back after a month because of increased bad publicity over the Ripper murders. Despite many historians and researchers' claims that the police acted professionally and with real intent on catching the Ripper, actions like this were obviously seen at the time as being half soaked to say the least. Barlow and Watt are fictional detectives that investigated the Ripper murders in a 1973 BBC documentary. They also asked the question why George Hutchinson's very detailed description was not acted on. All police officers, high ranking and low ranking, pledge allegiance to the Queen. The current standard oath of allegiance is set out in the Promissory Oaths Act. 1868 in the following form. I, whatever the policeman's name is, 
do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. The original judicial oath as set out in 1868 of Act Red. I, whatever the name of the police officer is, do swear that I will well and truly serve our sovereign lady Queen Victoria in the office of whatever the location of the judicial office is. And I will do right to all manner of people after laws and usages of this realm without fear, favour, affection or ill will. So help me God. The fourth person that warrants investigation is Sir William Gore. Sir William Gore, the first baronet, was a 19th century English physician. Of modest family origins, he rose through the ranks of the medical profession to establish a lucrative private practice and serve in a number of prominent roles in 1871, having successfully treated the Prince of Wales and future King of England Edward VII of a life-threatening attack of typhoid fever. He was created a baronet and was appointed to be one of the physicians in ordinary to Her Majesty Queen Victoria. He is often dismissed as being a Jack the Ripper suspect due to his old age and ill health at the time. But along with John Netley, he appears in every version of the royal conspiracy that I have seen. Multiple movies depict him as Jack the Ripper, but in these movies he was working with only Carmen John Netley. The earliest known allegation that links the Whitechapel murders with a prominent physician, not necessarily Sir William Gore, was in articles published by a number of US newspapers between 1895 and 1897. The first article appeared in the Fort Wayne Weekly Center on the 24th of January 1894 as well as other outlets. It reported an alleged conversation between William Greer Harrison, a prominent San Francisco citizen and Dr. Howard of London. According to Howard, Jack the Ripper was a medical man of high standing whose wife had become alarmed by his erratic behaviour during the period of the Whitechapel murders. She conveyed her suspicions to some of her husband's medical colleagues who, after interviewing him and searching the house, found ample proofs of murder and committed him to an asylum. Variations of the second article appeared in Williams Sport Sunday Grit, the Haywood Review, California, and the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This article comments the identity of that incarnate fiend was settled some time ago, and that the murder was a demented physician afflicted with a widely uncontrollable erotic mania. It repeats some of the details of the earlier reports but adds that Dr. Howard was one of a dozen London physicians who sat as a commission in lunacy upon their brother physician. For at last, it was definitely proved that the dreaded Jack the Ripper was a physician in high standing and enjoying the patronage of the best society in the West End of London. The article goes on to allege that the preacher and spiritualist Robert James Lees played a leading role in the physician's arrest by using his clairvoyant powers to divine that the Whitechapel murderer lived in an house in Mayfair. He persuaded police to enter the house, the home of the distinguished physician, who was allegedly removed to a private insane asylum in Islington under the name of Thomas Mason. Meanwhile, the disappearance of the physician was explained by announcing his death and faking a funeral. The identity of Dr. Howard, who is alleged to have provided the information for the first article, was never established. On the 2nd of May 1895, the Fort Wayne Weekly Gazette published a follow-up quoting William Greer 
as affirming the accuracy of the story and describing Dr. Eward as a well-known London physician who passed through San Francisco on a tour of the world several months ago. A further follow-up of the article in the London People on the 19th of May 1894 written by Joseph Hatton identified him as Dr. Benjamin Howard, an American doctor who had practiced in London during the late 1880s. The article was shown to Dr. Benjamin Howard on a return visit to London in January 1896, prompting a strong letter of denial published in the People on the 26th of January 1896. In this publication my name is dishonourably associated with Jack the Ripper in such of a way as if true renders me liable to show cause to the British Medical Council why my name with three degrees attached should not be expulged from the official register. Unfortunately for the parties of the other part there is not a single item of this startling statement concerning me which has the slightest foundation in fact. Beyond what I may have read in the newspapers I have never known anything about Jack the Ripper. I have never made any public statement about Jack the Ripper and at the time of the alleged public statement by me I was thousands of miles distance from San Francisco where it was alleged I made it. The Times newspaper carried out the following report on the 30th of January 1890. We regret to announce that Sir William Gould died at half past twelve yesterday at his residence 74 Brook Street, London from paralysis. Sir William was seized with a severe attack of paralysis just over two years ago while standing at Killy Cranky and never sufficiently recovered to resume his practice. On Monday morning after breakfast he pointed to his mouth as if he was unable to speak. Valet, who was in the room, did not quite understand what was amiss, but helped him into the sitting room. Sir William Gull then sat on a chair and wrote on a piece of paper, I have no speech. The family were summoned at once, and William Gull was soon after removed to bed, where he received every attendance from Dr. Herman Weber, an old friend, Dr. Charles D. Hood, a regular medical attendant, and Dr. Ackland, his son-in-law. The patient, however, soon lost consciousness and lingered in this state until yesterday morning when he quietly passed away in the presence of his family. The inquiries as to his state of health during the last two days have been unusually numerous. A constant stream of cabbages drawing up at the door, the Prince of Wales kept informed of Sir William's condition through Sir Francis Knollys. The final suspect that I believe merits an investigation and the ringleader of the Jack the Ripper gang according to some accounts is Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill. Like Francis Tumbotty, Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill could have had a hatred for women as he suffered from syphilis most of his adult life. Some report that he became infected during an encounter with a Blenheim housemaid. Some claim it was a drunken episode as a student with an old egg. There is little in the way of evidence connecting him to the Ripper cases other than the fact that he is said to have matched George Hutchinson's incredibly detailed description of the Ripper. But the lack of evidence could be intentional as some believe that Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill was among the highest placed Freemasons in the United Kingdom at the time. Some Jack the Ripper researchers deny he was even a Freemason. He was however initiated on the 9th of January 1871 with his brother George Spencer Churchill. Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill was believed by many to be a future Prime Minister in the making. 
even after he nearly destroyed his own career. In 1877, he fell out with the Prince of Wales, the future King of England, King Edward VII, whom he threatened to expose as an adulterer. He was marginalised by Prime Minister at the time William Gladstone, being sent to work as a Viceroy in Dublin for the next four years. But in 1885, Churchill was brought back into government as Secretary of State for India. And when the second Salisbury admission was formed after the general election of 1886, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer and leader of the House of Commons. It seemed that nothing would stop Randolph Churchill. And leader of the House of Commons. Oh, <laughs> darling. Dar I'm glad you're pleased because it's all you're getting. Good night. Randolph. Randolph, what's the matter? All the bitches. All of them. Queen Victoria described him as mad and odd. He was a disliked politician that made many enemies even among his own colleagues. Apparently this was due to his rude and offensive manner. On the 20th of December 1886 he surprisingly handed in his resignation. Various motives are said to have influenced him in taking this step. It was commonly supposed that he expected his resignation to be followed by an unconditional surrender of the cabinet and his restoration into office on his own terms. What happened is not what he expected. The cabinet was reconstructed with George Goshen as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Lord Randolph later said he had forgotten Goshen and his own career as a Conservative chief was dead. Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill made no speeches in Parliament from the 20th of July 1888 up until the 12th of November 1888. In 1891 he was sent to South Africa in search of both health as he suffered from syphilis and is said to have travelled the world looking for a cure and for relaxation. In 1891 he experienced an episode of severe confusion which some believed could have been down to acute high blood pressure. Earlier in 1882 he had an extended illness which Lady Randolph's Dovey refers to as tiredness and fevers. Later in mid-1893 Dr Rose told Jenny who was distraught over her husband's illness that Randolph's heart condition had nonetheless been cured. But around this time Randolph began to have speaking difficulties which were associated with hearing and balance problems. Over the next two years, 
up until his death in 1895, Lord Randolph complained of dizziness, palpitations and numbness in his hands and feet. He returned to politics in the general election of 1892 once more. His seat at South Paddington was uncontested, but he was active on the platform. And when Parliament met, he returned to the opposition front bench and again took a leading part in debate, attacking Gladstone's second Home Rule Bill. But it was soon apparent that his powers were undermined by the inroads of disease, he eventually became quick-tempered and combative. As the session of 1893 wore on, his speeches lost their effectiveness and he began to slur his words. In 1894, it was said that he was not so much listened to with interest, but with pity. His last speech in the House was delivered in the debate on Uganda in June 1894 and was said to be a painful failure. Lord Randolph was in fact dying of general paralysis. A journey around the world was undertaken in hope of curing his illness. Lord Randolph started in the autumn of 1894 accompanied by his wife but the illness had made so much progress that he was brought back in haste from Cairo. He reached England shortly before Christmas and died in London on the 24th of January 1895, exactly 70 years to the day before Winston Churchill died. Did the British government at the time cover up the Jack the Ripper murders to protect Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill and his accomplices? There are rumours that Queen Victoria was furious about the manner of the killings, despite her son, the Prince of Wales, and future King Edward VII taking part in the planning. Some stories even suggest that Queen Victoria personally ordered that Sir William Gulls should be sectioned, others say it was his wife. The reason the cover-up of Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill continues is due to him being from one of the wealthiest and most powerful aristocratic families in the United Kingdom and the world. His grandfather was John Spencer Churchill, the 7th Duke of Marlborough. The family reside at Blenheim Palace to this day. The two prominent members of the family during the 20th century were British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill and Princess Diana, who died and many believe was murdered exactly 99 years to the day after the first Ripper victim, Mary Ann Nichols. The Jack the Ripper killings were ordered by Queen Victoria and planned by the Prince of Wales and the future King of England, Edward VII. The cover-up was essential for national security and the preservation of the British monarchy.